We are here with an amazing uh, panel of powerful women to tackle kind of a tough subject. Uh, how do we take what's going on in the bro economy and turn it into the she economy? I think that's, that should be our mission. <laughs> um, I want to do a quick audience poll before I introduce the panel. How many of you, show of hands, have been what leanin.org calls the only? The only woman in the room, the only woman on a leadership team? <laughs> OK, basically everyone, myself included. Um, yeah, so we need to change this. We need to turn it around. Um, despite all the visibility and attention on the topic of diversity, we're not making enough prog progress. In some cases, we're going backwards. So um, all these lovely, smart women here are going to hopefully give us some insight into what we think can begin to not only make a dent, but really make a lasting change in the situation. So quickly to introduce Chandra Mitchell, um, GC of Yamaha Motor Ventures. Um, Yvonne Hutchinson, CEO of ReadySet. Now here we go, Kim. Kim Polese. She's the chairwoman and uh, founder of... Crowdsmart. Crowdsmart, sorry. It's, it's cold medicine, I apologize. And Claire Lee, um, head of early stage business at Silicon Valley Bank. So, um, as I was mentioning, right, we're not making enough progress and the, the stats are kind of going in the wrong direction. We know there's a gender gap, we know there's a pay gap. Um, last year, uh, California passed a law requiring, thank God, requiring at least one woman on, on a public company board. So you gotta start somewhere. It's not 20% 20, 20 female directors by 2020, but it's, we're starting. Um, last year, I think on tech boards, we had 15% women representation, which was unfortunately down from 2017 by two percentage points. So Chandra, I'll start with you. You know, what do you see as uh, opportunity? So I think, um, you know, obviously we have the, the legislation that was passed in California in terms of board representation, and I think that has been a move in the right direction. Um, obviously, any time that we can require a certain number of women sit on a board, that's, that's a very positive thing. Um, however, I do think that once you're at the table, kind of the most obvious thing to do, and I think I see women doing that every day, including these women here, is pulling others in. When you have an opportunity to weigh in on who's going to be the next board member, who's going to be the next VP, Pulling those ladies in, those people in, to have a more representative group at the table and expanding and changing the culture. I, I think the tricky thing with that, however, is obviously um, we're all susceptible to kind of pulling within our own circle, pulling people who look like us, have the same socioeconomic background, go to the same schools. So I think we have to really try to expand um, our view of who we're bringing to the table and not just you know, a mini Chandra. I would love to have lots of mini Chandras, but that's not the goal. We're trying to change the culture. We're trying to make it not just like you because we, we don't want to exchange one, one bro culture for another culture that's not as inclusive. Um, I think that's, that's a mistake. Um, the second thing is we don't have the numbers, so we have to find allies. Uh, we have to... Uh, basically find allies who are in those classes and basically work with them, educate, make people aware. I don't think some people just are not aware of these biases um, that they have, or some men, they have mothers and wives and daughters. And so sometimes it's just speaking up and trying to find allies to speak up on our behalf and you know, causing our organizations to do trainings and unconscious bias trainings. I think we can't do it alone and we shouldn't be expected to do it alone, but I think we are gonna to have to be intentional about finding uh, those allies and having them also speak with us. Absolutely. Um, and I think my final recommendation is really just do whatever we can to feed the pipeline, um, whether that's mentoring uh, subordinates, participating in groups with younger ladies or underrepresented communities to basically make them aware of opportunities and uh, successes that could be had in this industry. Um, so that's, that's kind of my approach to it. Love it. Awesome. Thank you. Kim, I'll go to you next. Um, uh, I was excited to hear, learn about CrowdSmart. I was focused on pronouncing your name correctly, so I forgot the name of your company. 
Um, but you know, it seems like you may have had some success in leveraging technology to reduce some of the bias that Chandra was just talking about. Maybe you can share some of that with us. Sure. Um, thank you. And happy to be here, delighted to be here this morning and be part of this panel. Um, so let me just briefly tell you a little about CrowdSmart. This is a company, it's a startup, uh, co-founded it four years ago, and we're using technology, in this case, collective intelligence, this, the power of cognitive diversity and AI to create a prediction platform for startup investing. So the idea is, problem, is we've got all this capital out there and all these talented entrepreneurs, how do we, how do we get them together? How do we unlock that capital and create more confidence? And so we're, we're creating bas basically a quantitative way of scoring startups to, to essentially increase investor confidence. Um, so let me just jump to the punchline. We've tested our prediction method by raising a small fund about three years ago. And we've invested in 27 companies. The top scoring companies, 40% of them are women founded or women led, which is really exciting. And it's, we think, a result of reducing ingrained bias because the way that these companies get scored is not who you know. You know, like the current scenario is really you've got to know someone in the venture capital industry. In this case, it's product market fit, team, traction, IP. It's all the stuff. It's what you know. It's your team and the quality of your team and, you know, basically your ability to execute on your idea. And so the idea that we could actually take this everywhere is really what is behind CrowdSmart. Because particularly, it's, the problem is here in Silicon Valley, but it's also everywhere across the country and around the world. And there's tons of money out there, right? So this is a different approach. It's early days, you know, small data set, but, you know, 80% have gone on to Series A or a significant up round, which is about four times better than industry average. Uh, so we're very encouraged about this. And again, it's one approach, early days, but I want to take this everywhere. I want to I want to use the power of cognitive I, I want to meet. I want to meet these companies. Yeah. <laughs> they should be clients of SVBs. Awesome. Yeah, it's pretty cool to see examples of leveraging technology to help make a difference in getting the pipeline, you know, where it needs to be. And uh, there's, I guess, there's software companies out there now uh, that are helping eliminate bias in hiring, just as an example, or help you fix your job description so they'll be more appealing to to women instead of using language that's like very male oriented. So I love it, that's awesome. Yvonne, um, I know you consult across a, a wide variety of you know, public sector, private sector, different industries. You know, I'm curious if you've seen anything in any one industry that maybe is doing better than everybody else? <laughs> Well, yeah, yes, I am. Um, yeah, thank you also for having me here. I, won't, I don't know if I've seen one thing, but I can give an example of where we've seen striking success. And um, I'm going to keep the name of this company anonymous. We'll be coming out with a case study later. But um, with one of the organizations, I've been working with them for about three years. And when I started working with them, um, about, uh, I would say, 10 to 12 percent of their incoming um, groups uh, were um, from underrepresented minority groups. And uh, today, three years later, we've raised that number to 45%, um, which is huge. It's a huge difference. And, um, and when we say underrepresented groups, we're really talking about uh, not just women, but also uh, black and brown folks as well, which is a, just a huge uh, success. And I think there are a few factors that led to that success, and I think it's important to put those out here. Um, and I think the, the, the first thing that I would say is by and large, we were just part of a smaller whole. I think this whole panel shows that you know you need a lot of moving parts, a lot of different kinds of agents to have holistic change in an industry, right? And, and the same happens at a company level. You need a holistic sort of solution to make sure things work. Um, the second is we had buy-in, and not necessarily at the top, but with people who had decision-making power. Power. And that's critical, right? They were bought in not just with um, the idea of we really like diversity, diversity is nice to have, wouldn't it be great if we were diverse, but they wanted to change. And I think buy-in at that level is really critical, not just commitment to the idea of diversity, whatever that is, but commitment to um, structural deep 
deep change. And I think the third thing is, one thing that we really worked with them on was understanding bias, yes, into personal and uh, unconscious, but also understanding systemic bias and the role their own systems played in perpetuating it or incorporating it, and really giving them the tools to think systemically about how to remove bias to achieve the goals that they wanted to achieve. And so I think that those are sort of lessons and approaches that we can extrapolate across industries to really think about what would be um, some uh, precursors uh, to see the kind of sustainable change that we're talking about today. That's awesome. Thank you. It's good to know there's some signs of hope out there. Um, but now we'll go to the tech industry. More specifically, Claire, I'm looking at you. Ten years at Microsoft, five years at Silicon Valley Bank. Um, it seems like things are perhaps even worse in the tech industry than, than other industries. Um, I read a stat that uh, of the 25 largest tech IPOs, half of them didn't have a single woman on, on their boards, and only 9.2% um, of them you know, did have a woman on the board. So it's, it's just like you know, pretty dismal. Um, in some cases, I think we're going backwards. We sort of talked about that on the prep call. Have you seen anything, a kind of sign, sign of positivity, or like what, what do you see in terms of getting women and minorities like, you know, a seat at the table? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, well, that, that's a huge question. But so I'm a hopeless optimist, and, you know, I think sometimes regardless of the data, um, I think it's, it's, it's creating quite a lot of momentum, right? So we know, we know that with every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, and that goes for, you know, politics as, as well as everything else, right? So I think what um, I've noticed is that we're at least more conscious, right? And so uh, maybe we're more conscious of our biases, and maybe we're more conscious of how um, hiring practices need to kind of catch up, you know, and all the things that you guys just mentioned, which definitely are steps in the right direction. So when I look at the, um, you know, the macro environment for fundraising, and which is, you know, which startups are, you know, obviously being formed, incorporated, launching products, um, founded by a woman or with a woman on the founding team. Um, and then basically, when you look at the wealth creation, that's what I'm conscious of, you know, if these companies do well, to your point, all these IPOs, which of course has a horrible effect on property in the Bay Area, um, you know, the, the, the notion that a very small percentage of that is gonna end up in the pockets of females is kind of crap. No, I just, I don't like that, you know? I mean, that's, that's the bold economics really just kind of tell the story. So what I'd really love to see is, is um, you know, a lot more representation in general. And it's not just gender parity we're seeking, it's, it's representation, right? Uh, I don't really like the term diversity because it kind of denotes that we're different. We're not at all, really. We're actually strikingly similar, at, at, you know, at the end of the day. Um, so some of the stats I just wanted to share, to your point, are we going backwards? The data kind of indicates that we are. Um, but I do want to highlight just a couple of things out of our women in tech leadership. Or we do a startup outlook report annually. So this was the fifth time that we actually did it um, looking at gender. So it was, you know, um, five years ago when we started it. And, you know, it's the fifth time, so we're looking at kind of trends, right? We're starting to see, okay, is it up, down, flat? What's happening out there? 72% um, of U.S. startups have no woman on the founding team. Wow. I kind of think that's a bit scary, mm -hmm. right? Think about all the decisions being made in a vacuum. When you have startups with all male founders, which is pretty common, as that data just suggests, only 5% of those companies have a female CEO. Again, think about who's in charge, who's making the decisions, and then who's set to benefit from any you know, exit in that company. Um, what I found striking is that China's numbers are way better than the US's. So just in case anyone's going to you know, assume that we're all fabulously civilized and developed and bleeding edge and all the rest of it because we're in Silicon Valley. 
That is not the case. Um, in fact, I would say sometimes things are worse in the valley. They're more acute. Um, and I've noticed that, you know, it's harder to change things uh, for that reason. But 56% of startups have at least one, one woman in the executive team. But when I look at, again, who, who's making the decisions? Who has the power? Um, and who's set to benefit from any, you know, positive um, financial transaction? And it's not, it, it's not women, right? So the, the, the statistics, as we know, when you start layering on other factors, such as, you know, you're, you're not Caucasian and all of these other things, right? How many female, like how many Latinas are on boards? Terrible, right? So, you know, I started looking into this um, a couple of years ago. Um, I ended up coining this phrase, the single digit club, which really um, pointed to three things, right? One is um, the percentage of female GPs, so general partners at venture capital firms. And again, they make a lot of money if they invest well, right? And it's hard to make money in venture, actually, it really is. The second one is then the percentage of global venture capital that is going to companies with a female founder on the founding team. Um, a couple of years ago, like it was what, $80 billion deployed? Um, 2018, we saw about $104 billion deployed globally in venture. 2% um, of that went to companies with a woman at the helm are on the founding team. So, um, so there's two, and the third one is basically just, again, looking at who's in power, right? You know, where are the women? Okay, the answer is they're everywhere, right? They're, there's very, very smart people of both genders everywhere. And what we're really striving to do is improve access. And so the startup outlook thing is, is actually a great start because to your point, I think we do need to get the data and we do need to have honest conversations about what the implications of that data really are. And if my daughter, who's now nine, kind of going on 19, I can't believe it starts so early with the boys thing, my God. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's striking now, I'm seeing already, like what is she gonna do? What, you know, what, like, what kind of campground is she gonna you know, find for herself? And so I'm, I'm striving, along with a lot of others, to make that campground better than, you know, when we leave it, better than how we found it um, for her and this whole generation of boys and girls who really, I think, need to inherit a very, very different landscape than the one we're currently sitting in. Totally. You know, um, we've mentioned unconscious bias a couple times. Uh, I was uh, preparing for this panel. I was rereading Emily Chang's book, Brotopia. If you haven't read it, it's not a fun read, but it's an informative and useful um, book to know about. Uh, and it, it does talk a lot about some of, uh, I think, going backwards in Silicon Valley and in tech. But one of the things that I, I ran across in, in revisiting that book was, even for companies that are doing the right thing, like Mark Benioff at Salesforce, and you know, declaring that women are gonna get equal pay for equal jobs. Um, they did that, whatever, a few years ago. Right. Two years went by, and then they had to do it again. Like, so, to me, that's an- We, we did the same. I mean, it, it's interesting. I think a lot of people accused Mark of doing it for PR purposes, but they did this pay audit, and they did close the gap, and it cost millions of millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. We did it, the same thing at SVB, and I'm very proud of that. And they didn't talk about it, they just did it. And that's leadership. Mm. You know, closing the gap, not tweeting about it, is really cool. And, and that's something that, again, you know, to, to both of your points, I think having these allies and advocates, like, honestly, that's the reason I'm at this company, is because the leadership absolutely, totally gets it. It makes economic sense. And to have representation in venture and in tech is absolutely imperative. It's not a nice to have anymore. It's just, it's critical. Totally agree. I mean, to me, the thing that was interesting about the Salesforce thing, aside from the advertising, is they closed the gap, a couple years went by, the gap, you know, had to be closed again. 
Like, what happened there? I mean, I, I had personally attribute that to unconscious bias, and I don't really know what happened there, but well, um, what do you guys think about how do we, how do you tackle unconscious bias? I mean, it's pretty insidious, right? It's hard. I, I don't like the phrase. I'm, I'm going to stop talking now, but I'll just say Hillary Clinton <laughs> nailed it when she said, yeah, that's total rubbish. Like, it's implicit bias. It's, just, it's, it's bloody bias. obvious <laughs> bias, right? It, you're, it's conscious bias. It's implicit bias. And so, yeah, I, I don't know that I buy into it's that. It's the first and the last thing. letter of the word bias. <laughs> exactly. Yes, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think in terms of, of, of Mark Benioff's um, uh, proposal, I think it's just like anything else where if you don't follow through, if you don't have, a com as a lawyer, a compliance program to make sure that you do this one big splash and then you forget about it and, hey, let's look and, oh, wow, it's failed. Of course it's failed. Nobody is responsible yeah. for making sure that it's a success. So I think that if you, you know, obviously we sometimes have to fail. This was an example. And hopefully when companies institute these types of programs, they realize, you know what, we can't just do it one time and expect everything else that's causing the wage gap will go away because it will not. The people are still there. The biases are still there. The way we make decisions are still there. And so you really have to basically mind, make sure that it's, you know, you're keeping an eye on, on the goal. Yeah, and I'll add to that and say, if you're solving for one thing in your organization, like pay equity, but not solving for other things, then those other things are eventually going to undo the one thing that you're solving for. Yeah. Yeah, um, I used to work at a large uh, global bank, and uh, there was an ongoing dialogue there about you could get the women promoted into the senior roles, but they frequently wouldn't stay because a lot of the other, let's just say, environmental factors were not addressed. Kim, I'm curious with um, AI, there's, you know, obviously AI is pretty much uh, in its hype phase, I think, right now. And there's a lot of talk about all the men programming AI and programming, probably white men programming in, you know, um, implicit bias or whatever, programmatic bias. How have you tried to tackle that or, you know, prevent that, if you will, with your platform? Yeah. Um so it's a, it's a huge risk that we are just reinforcing existing bias in AI because we're training the AI. And who's training the AI? That's the question. So that's the, the approach that we're taking and I think that, that I think, think has a lot of promise is getting multiple voices, diverse voices, representational voices of the entire population uh, expertise and experiences from all different areas, getting those people to train the AI and creating a, a systematic way of doing that. Again, it has to be very intentional. It has to be measured. Um, it, it's not something that's going to magically happen by itself. And just briefly, the way that we're doing this at CrowdSmart is we actually get about 25 to 35 cognitively diverse people together to score these startups on investment readiness on a whole bunch of different measures. And during that scoring process, by the way, you don't know who's saying what. So everyone voice, everyone's voice has equal weight. Um, so this is a way, again, about really tapping into that knowledge and wisdom that exists in everybody and the power that comes from a diverse group of people making predictions or leading a company or creating a product you get better results. You get more accuracy and you get better results. So again, it comes back to who's training the AI. Let's make sure that's a very diverse and representational group of people. Otherwise, we just reinforce bias. And this is probably not an apples to apples comparison, but you just think about, you, you mentioned 40% of the companies getting funded on your platform are women-led. Right. And you talked about, Claire, you know, 2% of 100 billion plus in venture capital going to women, so big difference. I don't know if we can, like, that's a fair comparison, but it's interesting. So I have no idea how much more time we have. Should I open it up for questions now? Five minutes? So we have at least five minutes for questions. Anybody have any questions that you'd like the panel to respond to? Thank you very much. I've been in Silicon Valley since 2006 and been in technology and leadership, so this all resonates so much. Um, so I have a startup that's also using technology to accelerate women getting on corporate governance. And uh, one thing that I've been hearing quite a bit, um, and, I'll, and I'll mirror it with what's happening on the political stage with AOC versus Nancy Pelosi, 
is that board members will say, if I have another millennial telling me that they want to join my board after having only been doing X for X number of years, I'm going to like jump off a cliff. So I'm curious to get your perspective on how do you find the right balance between recognizing that millennial and soon Gen Z leaders have so much to contribute on at the table, but also acknowledging that there are certain sort of experiences and the sort of stripes that you have to earn to be in corporate governance. Um, because I think that that is a paradigm that's happening really profoundly right now in a way, especially with women millennials, that hasn't happened before. Ooh, interesting question. Anybody want to take that one? Yeah, general, generational leadership is something we've um, been, again, really conscious of. I mean, I, I, I work with early stage companies, right? So younger founders, mostly the majority. Um, and therefore, my team needs to mirror that demographic. And I'm pleased to say it's a group of 40, 50, probably, possibly the most diverse team at the company, for sure. Um, but I'm, I'm with you on that. I think it's risky, obviously, taking, you know, younger people who haven't um, had the chance to go wearing their stripes yet. But if you don't blend um, a couple of different, you know, grapes, you're not going to get a really good wine, right? I think you're just going to end up, um, you know, getting the same answers all the time, like to, your, to, to the questions. So breaking that circle, I think breaking that pattern is really, really important, but doing it at a, le a level of leadership and, and taking the risk and, and, you know, saying, okay, it's not about you know, ageism is another factor, right, in Silicon Valley, we all know this, but being able to say that your skills and your perspective are valued, regardless of what you look like, what age you are, whether you went to Harvard or Yale or Princeton or community college, it shouldn't matter in the end, because we all earn our stripes one way or another. Yeah, and I would just piggyback off of that and say, what, what, I mean, there's research that shows what you're talking about is very true, right? That mo millennials expect promotions earlier than, um, you know, their counterparts from other generations. Um, as an older millennial myself, I don't always understand why this is, but I think that there's another underlying question, which is, I think when we talk about corporate governance, and, you know, I used to sort of work adjacent to CSR, I understand um, like why that's super important. I think it's important to identify um, what sort of experience we're looking for, right? Because it could be argued that traditional ways of figuring out who is tasked with that responsibility haven't quite worked, right? Corporate, <laughs> you know, governance um, on, on the corporate side isn't always um, effective in the ways that we think of. It's not always conducive to the kind of change we want to see. It's not always moving in a direction that's positive. And so it, it could be argued that someone with different experience, I don't know if we want to term it as greater or less, but different experience may add a necessary viewpoint that could shift uh, the, the, an organization at a board level in a, in a direction that it needs to go. Because, you know, there are also people who, and I don't want to stereotype older people, but the longer you're in the system, the more invested you are and entrenched within it, right? So there can be an argument made that, you know, fresh eyes, a fresh voice is uh, more conducive to, you know, pushing organizations in the way they need to go. Love it. How about other questions? Thank you for the fruitful discussion. Um, what have you been seeing or how do you think about trying to find a balance between being your authentic self as a woman or just as a person in general versus if you have a seat at the table or you're trying to get a seat at the table and feeling pressured to, in a sense, masculinize yourself in order to have the right um, recognition, whether it's your resume or the way you dress or even dropping your tone. Where, where is the balance in that and what have you guys been seeing as far as where that trend is going and how people are addressing those issues? That's a great question. I love it. One of the other things I, I uh, read in the, reread in the Brotopia book was about Pad Warrior. Um, and in the early part, she's had tremendous success in, in Silicon Valley at Cisco and you know, um, uh, subsequent companies, and she spent the first like decade of her career dressing in suits and kind of like not being her true authentic self, to because she was literally the only woman in the room. She had a big job at Cisco, like CTO or something. But um, anybody want to take a run at that one? I would love to because I think <laughs> this is a 
subject that is really close to my heart. Um, I show up in spaces uh, as a woman, yes, but as a black woman first. And it's really hard for me to separate and tease out those two identities. And so for me, the pressure to conform or mask who I am to make people feel more comfortable has been present all my life. And before I started Ready, Set, I was an international human rights lawyer. I went to Harvard. And so in each of those spaces, there was a different kind of pressure to present in a different kind of way to be taken seriously. I can say from experience, that every time I conformed to that pressure, what, it, what I did didn't work, right? It never, it never quite made it so that I was treated equally or got equitable opportunity in the space. It just made it so that I was always thinking about how I presented to other people and spending less time thinking about my ideas, thinking about how I could support the group, thinking about my career trajectory. It was a cognitive tax. And so I think, yes, there's a balance that we need to strike. Obviously, you know, you can't bring your whole self into work, right? You can't roll up in pajamas, you know, and slippers and be like, I'm ready to do a job, right? You can't do that. But I think that in terms of bringing your authentic self to work, which is the question that you ask. I think it, it is um, at a certain point necessary to push the envelope. And, and a mentor of mine who is a VP at the Honeywell Corporation, is also a black woman, she said, well, Yvonne, you could contort yourself for the rest of your life, right? And not, you know, get to where you want to go. I walk into rooms where I'm accepted as my authentic self because those are the rooms where I'm going to be effective. And so I would say to your question, um, gauge those rooms. And if you can't show up as your authentic self, you may not be able to be effective like you want to be in that room. And it's important for you and your career to be honest with yourself about that. When is the brick wall going to be too hard? When are, when are my energies going to be better utilized in another space? So, I mean, I, I tend to be pretty radical in that position, but I, that is what my experience has sort of shown me. One of the things that uh, I think is a benefit of age, since I've been around a while, um, I don't, you know, like, the, I don't think you can tap into your full power, as you were saying, unless you're being your full authentic self. Um, I think it's just a much more powerful way to be in the world, in, in all aspects of the world. But I, the older I've gotten, like, I don't care, fire me, you know? I mean, really, I'll be fine. I'll go get a job someplace else. And I don't want to work with people who aren't willing to accept others for their authenticity and their authentic selves. So, um, my two cents. Yeah, I think adaptability is really key. I mean, it, it, it's been proven as well, grit, resilience, and adaptability and all this. Um, the ability for you to learn from your mistakes, pivot, move on, all that great stuff. But at the same time, you've got to be, you've got to be really authentic. And so uh, one of the millennials actually who worked for me, um, um, she's incredible. She wrote a whole post about adaptability quotient, AQ being the new e EQ or IQ. And it's fascinating because I think that's, that's how a lot of these younger people and, you know, older people, right, alike, are, are successful, knowing how to be adaptable, but being authentically adaptable. You gotta, you gotta have a true north. And honestly, the only times I get into trouble is when I don't trust my instinct and I try to change myself or contort to Yvonne's point into something that I am not. And I have just been pretty forthright about not adapting the pieces of me that are me. And there's balconies and basements to that. I tend to be fully self-expressed and swear a lot. You know, I'm Irish, so <laughs> what do you expect? You know, I have an interesting vocabulary. But I attempt to dial it down a bit if I'm addressing people on the board of directors, because I need them to like me and what I'm doing. <laughs> so you know, it's. I think you gotta. You gotta really. I don't know. Just have that inner confidence. But I'll tell you, being forty something, I just don't care either. It's just amazing. Like it's liberating. I hope you can all get there. But it's. It, it's a really great place to be, and I wish I had this confidence um, when I was 20-something or 30-something. Yeah. yeah, I think yeah. it takes a while to quiet that voice in your head that's telling you that your authentic self is not enough or not what's needed. 
once you embrace that, as everyone said, you really get your power. There is no way, just as Yvonne said, when I walk in a room, there's nothing I can do, no amount of clothes that will not let people know I'm, I'm an African-American woman. And so you embrace that and you make it clear. I'm here because I am different. <laughs> you, if you wanted another clone, which sometimes they do, oh well, you got me. <laughs> um, I can't change my voice. Early in my career, someone, I have a lower baby voice, I was told. And in one of my reviews, an attorney told me, well, you can't change your voice, but dot, dot, dot. And then I realized, this is crazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. There is nothing I can do. There's nothing you can do. So I, I know when you're, you're junior and younger, it's harder, but you really have to work on quieting that inner voice um, because I think a lot of times it is, it's, it's the voices that we're, we're, we're telling ourselves and, and not necessarily what others are thinking about. And I would just, I know we have 30 seconds, but I would just say to the junior point, if you're a junior, I think it's even more important to identify the space that you can go into and succeed, right? Because we're tempted to just sort of bite, sell, bite the bullet. You just, you know, you adapt until you no longer have to. And I actually think that can be very detrimental to your career path, right? So understanding where there's some ask, like whatever, where they're reasonable and also where you're being asked to be a totally different person, I think is crucial in identifying an environment where you're going to be able to flourish and grow. All right, so we surpassed like three different 30 second warnings so, or something. Um, I hope you guys uh, were able to take away at least a few ideas about how we can, um, things we can do to really promote um, change, getting the, the percentages in the right direction. Please join me in thanking these amazing kick-ass broads.